Everyone has moments in their life where they need help. Real help from a real person. A true human connection. Tell Me What Happened, an original podcast created by OnStar, is a new series that tells stories of those exact moments. Every episode features a person needing assistance and a stranger stepping up to provide it. They are stories that will leave your heart racing and your spirit lifted. Join me for Tell Me What Happened, true stories of people helping people. Today, Time Stopped Moving by Pregna Buck- Buccaneer. Dave Miller would, would never have done it. Had never had he been in his right mind, the Millers were not a medically stock. Hardly the sort of people you'd expect to read about in the morning paper for taking their lives the night before. But Dave Miller was drunk, a bubbly, verily so. Bowed a big revolver he stood against the sink, made a ring of coldness against his right temple. Dawn was beginning to strain and frosty kitchen windows, faint light the letter lay a grey square against the drain board window tiles. With a melodic gesture, the very drunk, Miller scrawled across the envelope, This is why I did it. He had found Helen's letter in the envelope when he staggered into their bedroom fifteen minutes ago, quarter past five. As had frequently happened during the past year, he'd come home from the store a little late, about twelve hours late. In fact, this time Helen had done what he had long threatened to do. She left him. There was brief, containing a word of heartbreak and broken hopes. I don't mind having to scrimp, Dave. No woman minds that if she feels she's really helping her husband again. Over her, her helping her husband over a spot. When the business went bad a year ago, I told you, I ready to help any way I could, but you haven't let me. You quit fighting when things got difficult. Put it all in your money and energy and liquor, liquor and houses and cards. I can't stand being married to a drunkard. Dave, not even, but not, I could stand being married to a drunkard, Dave, but not a coward. She said she was trying to, she said, so she was trying to show him, but Miller told himself she would show her instead. Coward her, maybe this would teach her a lesson, how of a lot of help she had been, nagging him every time he took a drink. Holy a bloody murder when he went put twenty five dollar bucks on a horse with a chance to make five hundred. What man wouldn't do these things? His drug store was on the skids. Could he be blamed for drinking a little too much if alcohol dissolved the morbid vapours of his mind? Miller stiffened angrily and tightened his finger on the trigger, but he had one moment of frank insight. Just before the hammer dropped and brought the world tumbling about his ears, he brought with, re- with it a realisation. The whole thing was his fault. Helen was right. He was a coward, with a potent ache in his heart. He had been as loyal as they came. He knew that. He could have spent his nights thinking up new business tricks instead of spilling big whiskey. Could have gone out of his way to be pleasant to customers, not sat with them with a terrific hangover. Ian Miller knew... Nobody ever made any money on horses, at least not what he when he needed it. But horses and whiskey and business have become tragically confused in mind. So he was full of liquor and managed with a gun to his head. And again, anger swept his mind, clean of reason. He knew he'd chin, free chin up and grit the gun tight. Run out of me, will she? He muttered thickly, well, this shall show her. Next moment the gun at the hammer fell, and though Miller had shown her, but opened his eyes from a start. A brain, the plane's black and white, he heard a bell ring. A most filling sound in the world. It was a mistakeable tinkle of crashing of sir. Now, how in the hell? Thought began his mind. Then he saw where he was. The crash register was right in front of him. It was open. A marble slab lay at Carsman's five spot. Marble glanced, Mark Miller glanced straight up around him. Behind the drug cattle, right? There was a man and a girl sipping cokes of fountain. You're right, in a magazine rack by the open door, tobacco counter, Christopher found in the fountain. Right up before him was a customer. Good Lord, he thought. Was this all a dream? Sweat oozed from all out from his clammy forehead. The stuff of Herman's he had drunk during the game had a drank taste, but he wouldn't, couldn't, wouldn't have thought anything short of a marijuana would produce such hallucinations. He just had 
wild contractions came boiling up from the bottom of his, his being. How did he get behind the counter? Who is the woman he's waiting on? What? Well, the curious stare was well, just jarring completely into the present. Get rid of her, was his thought, one thought. Then he sat down behind the scenes and tried to figure it all out. His hand poised over the cash drawer. And he remembered he didn't know how much he was, was to take out of the five. A moment, knowing the woman's glance, he uttered, Let me see now. Was uh, How much did I say? Well, I made no answer. Miller cleared his throat and said uncertainly, Lee, I beg your pardon, man. Did I say 25 cents? It was just a feeling. The woman didn't even answer to that. It was right then that Miss Dr. Miller noticed a deep silence that brooded in the store. Slowly his head came out and looked straight in the woman's eyes. She turned him with a cool, half-swelling glance. But her eyes neither blinked nor moved. His her features was frozen, her lips partly, teeth showing a little, and the top of her tongue was between her, even white teeth. Though she had started to say at this, and stopped with the syllables and not spoken. Muscles began to rise behind Miller's ears. He could feel his hair soft, fiffed like fillings drawn to a magnet. His glance struggled to soda fountain. When he saw them, they shook him to the core of his being. Girl who was sipping a drink of coke had glass to her lips. Perhaps she didn't, wasn't sipping the liquor. Her boyfriend's glass was on the counter. He'd drawn out a cigarette and sailed the grey smoke. The smoke hung in the air like a large, elegant balloon, the small end disappearing between his lips. The miller stared. The smoke did not stare, stir. Stardust. There was something unholy, something unnatural about this scene. The apparition rippling down his spine, Dr. Dave Miller reached across the cash register and touched the woman on the cheek. Flesh was warm, but it was hard as flint. Tenderly, the young druggist pushed harder. Finally, he shoved her with his might. With all of his for all the result, the might well, might have been a two-ton bronze statue. She neither budged nor changed expression. Panic seized Miller. His face hit a high, hysterical terror. He called to his soda joker. Pete, Pete, he called, shouted. What in God's name's wrong here? The blonde youngster with a towel waved a glass. Do not stir. Miller rushed back from the back of the store. Seized the boy with his shoulders, tried to shake him. But Pete was rooted to the spot. Miller knew now that was, that was wrong. It was something greater than a hallucination or hangover. He was some kind of he was in some kind of trap. His first thought was to come home, rush home and see Helen was there. It was a great sense of relief when he thought of her. Helen had really blue eyes and unstanding manner. He would listen to him and know what was the matter. He left the haunted drug store and ran, died around the corner and up the street to his car. But through, he did not lock the car door. Locked the, the car. The door resisted his twisting grass, shaking, pouring, swearing. Rest, Miller wrestled with each of the doors. Abruptly, he stiffened. A horror of thought leapt in his being. His gaze left the car and wandered up the street, past the inspector intersection, past the one beyond that, up on for the thoroughfare, to the grey haze of the city, dimmed everything. As far as Mary Miller could see, of no trace of motion. Cars are poised the street, some passing over machines, some turning corners. A streetcar stood over a safety zone. A man had leaped in from the bottom step, hung in a space a foot above the pavement. Projection of poles with one foot up. A bird hovered over a telephone pole, its wings glued to the blue vault of the sky. With choked sound, Miller began to run. He did not slacken his pace for fifteen minutes until when so around him was the familiar reassuring trees and sub-boarded houses, his own street, but yet, but yet how strange to him. The season was autumn, the air filled with brown and golden leaves, they tossed up a frozen wind, Miller run by two boys lying on lawn, petrified in modern counterparts, sculptors arrest us, a Swedish train of burning leaves, but a thrill of terror to him, but looking down an alley, and whence his smoke drifted, he saw a man tending to the fire, where those leaping flames with red tongues that did not move. So in relief, the young druggist started up, darted up to his own walk. He tried the front door, found it locked, and jammed the thumb against the doorbell. But of course, the little bell 
but it was immovable as a mountain. At the end, not to convince himself that a key could not be inserted in the lock, he ran towards the back. The screen door was not latched, but it might as well have been still door for bank vault. But they began to pound it, shouting, Helen, Helen, are you in there? God, my God, dear, there's something wrong. You've got to. The silence that flowed in again, but his voice choked off. Dead stillness of tomb. He could hear his voice rustling through the empty rooms. At last came back to him like a taunt. Helen! Helen! The day Miller, the world is now a planet of death, which he alone lived and moved and spoke, daggered and utterly beaten. He made an attempt to break into his home. He did stumble around to the kitchen window, tried to peer in, anxious to see there was a body on the floor. Room was in semi-darkness, however. His straining eyes made out nothing. He turned to the front of the house, scrambling like a sombolis. Seated on the boat, steps, head in hands, he slipped into a hell of regrets. He knew now that his suicide had been no donation. He was dead away. This might be, be hell or perjury. perjury. Billy cursed his drinking and led him such a mad thing as suicide. Suicide, he, he, Miller, coward had taken his own life. Miller's whole being called with revulsion. He just had the last year to live over again, he thought fervently. Yet, though all, for it all, some inner strain kept trying to tell him he was not dead. This was not his own world, all right. It was his, this was his own world, right. Eventually unchained, essentially unchained. What happened? It was beyond the pill of Gehemir Gesper. This one thing began to be clear. This is what in this world, which, in which change or motion to any kind was a foreigner. Fires would not burn, smoke would not rise, doors would not open. Liquids were solid, Miller's stubbing toe would, could not move a pebble. A blade of grass, easy to put his weight without bending. In other words, Miller began to understand, change had been stopped. As surely as his master hand had put a finger on the world's balance wheel, Miller's ramblings were terminated by his consciousness. He had an acute headache. He may have tasted, as Herman used to say, on a big night. As if an army had camped in it, coffee and bromo were what where were what he needed. But it was a great awakening to him. He found a restaurant and learned he could neither drink the, the coffee or get the lid off the bromo bottom. Very went coffee stream hang over the glass but her. But even as his steam was a brick wall to his probing touch, Miller started gloomily to tread for his way for the waiters. In back and the back of the counter again. Moments later, he stood in the street, and there were tears streaming in his eyes. Helen, and his voice was pleading in a whisper. Helen, honey, where are you? With no answer, but a pitiful permutation of utter silence. Then there was movement on da- at Dave Miller's right. Something shot from behind the parked jaws, cars, crashed against him, something brown and hairy and soft. He knocked him down. Before he could get his breath, a red, wet tongue was licking his face and hands. He was looking up in the face of a police dog, frantic with joy at seeing another in his city of death. The dog would scarcely let Mullen rise. He stood up a plant, big paws on his shoulders, tried to lick his face. Lala laughed out loud, a laugh, for he captured it. Where you come from, boy? he asked. Won't they talk to you either? What's your name, boy? There's a heavy brass studded collar. And then he, and it was a neck. A minute, they better read it on his little name plate. Major. Well, Major, at least we've got company now. It was made a sigh of relief. <sighs> For a long time, he too busy, the dog to bother about the subbing noises. Apparently the dog were hurled to hear them, but he gave no sign. Miller scratched him behind the ear. What shall we do now, Major? Walk? Maybe your nose can smell out another friend for us. They'd gone hardly two blocks when it came to him. 
there was a, a, a more useful way of spending the time. A library, hard convinced the whole trouble seen at them with suicide shot in the head, which was officially comp- absent now. He decided the perusal of a surgery box in the public library might yield something he could use. But he then bent their steps, and soon mounting the broad cement stairs at the building. As he went beneath the brass turn to a stall, Larry and Court Spinner's attention with a running glance, he smiled back. I tried to find something on brain surgery. His plain eye was shot, then he realised he'd been talking to himself. In that instant, in the next instant, they were in a world of voice from the bookcases travelled. If you find anything, I wish you'd let me know. I'm stuck myself. The corner of the room came an elderly, bald, bald man with tangled grey brows, rueful smile. Mental balance of his hair, a notebook clutched in his hand. You too, he said. I, just, I had hoped I was the only one. Miller went forward, hurriedly to grip his hand. I'm afraid I'm not s- so unselfish, he admitted. I've been hoping for two hours and run into some other poor soul. Quite understandable, the stranger murmured sympathetically. But my case is different, you see. I'm responsible for this whole tragic business. You, demon who gulped in a word, I thought. Marion wagged his hand, staring at the notepad with little with jumbled calculations. Miller had a chance to study him. He was tall, heavily built, wide, stuck, sturdy shoulders, despite his sixty years oddly. He wore a grey green smock, his eyes were narrowed, intent, looked grim it sharp beneath those toothbrush brows of his. He was stared at the pad. There's the trouble right there, he muttered. I probably had only three stages of implication, whereas four would have been barely enough. No matter, wonder the phase didn't carry through. I guess I don't follow you, Miller faltered. You mean something you did? I should think it was something I did. Body stranger snatched his, scratched his head and tip of his pencil. I'm Joe Anson. You know the Warner Maker Institution? Well, Muller said, ah, it's an understanding voice. Erickson was head of Wonomanka. Institute first had authority them all when it came to exploding atoms and braiding trails in the wilderness of science. Erickson peace his eyes was sunny boring to the young man. You've been sick, have you? He demanded. Well, no, not really sick. I'm druggish coloured. I have to admit to being drunk a few times hours ago, though. Drunk? Erickson shook, struck his tail and turned his cheek. Took his hand, squalled. No, that would hardly do it. There must have been something else. The impulsor isn't that powerful. I can understand about the dog, poor fellow. He might have been run over. I caught him just at the instant of passing from life to death. Old Dave Miller lifted his head, knowing how that now that Erickson was driving at. Well, I might as well be frank. I committed suicide. That's how a drunkard was. It wasn't been a suicide in the Miller family in centuries. It took a skinful liquor to set the president. Erickson nodded wisely. Perhaps we will find a president. President has not really been set. And well, no matter. He lifted his hand. He lifted his hand. Stop. Miller eager, wondering a separation. A point is, young man, we are free in a very tough spot. It's up to the rest of us to get out of it. All in, and uh, not only we, but heaven knows how many others were well over. Would you maybe can explain to my mind, mind what happened? Miller suggested. Of course, forgive me. You see, Mr. Miller, Dave Miller. David, it is a feeling we're going to be pretty well located for this over. See, David, I'm a nut or so on so called time phrase. A seen time compared to anything from an identity, a long pink worm. I disagree with them all because they postulate the idea that the time is constantly being manufactured. Each reasoning is fantastical, fantastic. Time is this, but not as an ever growing chain of links. Yeah, because such a, a, a chain would have to have a tail end if it, if it had a front end. One could imagine a like, period when time did not exist. So I think time is like a circular train track unending. Who find and die, who may travel around on it. The future exists simultaneously with the past. One instance they met, well, from the one instance they met, Miller's brain was murmuring. Eric has shot the words for him, Starocco confession. As if there are things known, great pinna, 
Karima days. The young druggist scratched his head. You got me licked, he admitted. I'm a stranger here myself. Naturally, you don't can't be expected to understand things I've seen all my life puzzling about. Simply way, simply way I can explain it. That we're on a train following this immense circle of railway. Where the train reaches the point where it started, it's about to plunge in the past. But this is impossible because the point where it started is simply the corrosive of the vein. A point is always ahead and behind the time train. Now my idea was that with the proper stimulus, a man could be trust first across the diameter circle of railway, the point of his past, because in the nature of time, he could either go ahead of the train and meet the future, but nor could he stand still and let the caboose catch up with him. But he could detour across the circle, land but further back on the train. And that, my dear boy, is what you and I and Major have done almost. Almost, David, then I said... Miller said hoarsely. Erickson pursed his lips. We're going nowhere apart. We are somewhere partly because of space. Being present and past, we are living in an instant. We move neither forward nor back. You and I, Dave, and Major. And the Lord knows how many others the world over have been thrust with my time repulsor to a timeless beach of eternity. We have caught in time's backwash. Castaways, you might say. Objection clamoured for attention in my inner's mind. But if this is so, where is the rest of them? Where is my wife? If I hear Eric explain, no doubt you you could see your wife if you could find her. But you see their their moustaches because of us. Time no longer exists. There is something I did not count on. I did not know it would be possible to live in one in, in small instant of time as we are doing. I did not know that only those hovering between life and death could elevate. Deviate from the normal process of time. You mean we're dead? Willard's voice was a bit of monotone. Obviously not. We're talking and moving, aren't we? But we are all on the fence. I gave my impulse to the jolt of high power. It went wrong. I think something must have happened to me. At the same time, instant, instant, they had shot you, shot yourself. That's Dave, you dying. The only way of us to find out, to try to get the machine working, trouble ourselves. One day, or one way or another, we fall back, or we will live. We will, we will all live. If we fall the present, we may die. Either way, it's better than this, Miller said fervently. I take came to the fiber here. I've been to find one of the things I must know. My own books are locked in my study, and these, they might be cemented in these places. But all they're used to me. I suppose we might as well go back to the lab. Miller nodded murmurly. Maybe you'll get an idea when you look at the machine again. Let's hope so, said Erickson grimly. God knows I've failed so far. It was hours so solid I walk with West Wiltshire, where the laboratory was immense bronze glass doors of one of the main institutions. A closed and so barred to the two men, but Erickson led the way down the side. You can't get in the service door. We climb for the transoms and ventilators until we get to the la- my lab. Major Frist along beside them. You join in action and companionship. It's less an adventure to Miller. Your new death might be ahead of for, three of, for all the three of them. So we were removing a heavy cabinet, the side service door, to get them in. We climbed up back to or the rear workman, walked across the cabinet and scaled across the, down the front of their leading man, we went up the stairs to the fifteenth floor. They were called for a transom into Mark Wing Mart's experimental entry, and only by his appointment. May us help through it. As there they were crawling along the dark metal tunnel, and opened an air conditioning vent Small and took some wiggling. Next room, they were confronted by a stern receptionist whose desk was a little brass sign reading, Have you an appointment? 
Millard his share of experience with such as ways, the days of a primary chemical salesman. He took the greatest pleasure now in lighting his cigarette from a match struck on the girl's nose, blew the smoke in her face, a call hastened to call through the final ransom. John Erickson's laboratory is well lit by a glass brick wall and high skylight, the sky and sun's rays glinted on the time pulsar, the scientists explained the pulsar in precise terms. When he finished day Millen just Knew just as little as before, the yeah, it still resembled three transmitters in line, a tight seam and a power cable, uh, power pole was connected to a great bronze globe hanging from the ceiling. There's a monster puts, that puts up this plate, Eric has gone grunted, too strong to be legal, too weak to do the job right. Take a good look, look. His hands jammed in his pockets, he frowned at the complex machinery. Miller stared a few minutes and transferred his interest to the other things in the room. He was struck by the resemblance of a transformer, the far corner of the ones linked of the trans in Pulsar. What's that? he said, uh, said quickly. Looks the same as the ones you used over there. It is. But didn't you say you needed, you needed, was it, all you needed was another stage of power? That's right, maybe in crazy Miller stared from Stared from the impulsor to the French woman back. Again, why didn't you, you use it then? Use what? For the, the connection? Erica's eyes gently mocked him. Why, of course? The gentleman side his jerked to the thumb. A small blade of bell of copper wire. Bring it over and we'll try it. But it was halfway to it. To it when he brought, brought, up, sh- brought up short. And she would grin spread over his features. I get each other with the bell or bell or wire. Might be the Empire State Building, as far as we're concerned. Forgive my stupidity. Exodus suddenly became serious. I'd like to be a submissive day, he muttered. In all fairness to you, you might, I must tell you, I see no way out of this. Machine is, of course, still working. The extra stage of power and suddenly should be over. And there, aware in this world of immovable things, where we find a piece of wire, 25 five feet long. There's a warm, moist sensation of almost against John Miller's hand when he looked down, Major stared up at him commiseratingly. He was scratching behind the ear and the dog closed his eyes, assured and happy. The old dog his side, wishing with some giant hand. He snatched, scratched him behind the, the ear and smoothed his troubled way over. If we don't get out, he said soberly, we starve, I suppose. No, I don't think I'd be able that it'd be quick that quick. I don't feel any hunger. I don't expect to. Oh after all my body was still live in one instance of time. A man won't wake up healthy appetite for one second. Of course this elastic second business but uh precludes the possibility of disease. Our bodies must go on and change. The only hope is I see is when we are on the verge of man is suicide. It means jumping off a bridge, I suppose. Poison, guns, knives, all the usual with we will are denied to us. Black despair closed down on Dave Miller. He thrust it back, forcing a crooked grin. Let's make a bargain, Ilford. When we finish fooling around with this apparatus, we split up. We'll be each other's throat if we stick together. I'll be blaming you for my plate. I don't want to. My fault, of course. It's my fault as much as yours. How about it? John Erickson gripped his hand. You're all right, Dave. Let me give you some advice. If you ever have to get back to the present, keep away from liquor. Liquor and the Irish never did mix. You have that store on its feet again in no time. But the thanks look favourably. I think I can promise and I think less than a whiskey antidote for a snake bite, whatever make me bend an elbow again. Like a couple of hours, despondency reigned in the laboratory, but it's soon to be deposited again for, by hope. The way all Erican started to trailing it is Dave Miller himself grasped the down to earth idea and started him hoping again. He was walking about a lab, jingling keys in his pocket, when suddenly he stopped short. He jerked the key and the rings in his hand. Now seen cross. We've been blind. Look at this. The scientist looked. We've been puzzled. Well, he said sceptically. 
You're skeptically? Look, there's our wire, Dave exclaimed. We got keys, I got keys. You got coins, nice wristwatches. Why can't we lay them all at one end to the end? Excellent features looked at it as if you've been been literally shot. You're hit you hit it, he cried. But if he had enough, got enough. Well on the call they began emptying their pockets, tearing off right which watches, searching for pencils. They, the fires made a little heap in the middle of the floor. Erickson let his long fingers crawl look, through rimming hair. God give us enough. We only need one wire. The thing is plugged in already, and only the positive pole has and only the positive pole has to be connected to the globe. Come on. Snooping up the assortment of metal articles. They rushed across the room, but with his penknife, Dave Miller began breaking up the metal rich watch straps, opening the links out so they would be laid end to end uh, to the greatest possible length. They patiently broke the watches to pieces, and the junk they gathered made a ragged foot and a half wire. The coins stretched the line still further. Then... They had two feet covered the stuff was half used up. Their metal pencils taken away gave them a good two feet. Key chains helped generously. With 18 feet covered, their progress began to slow down. Perspiration poured down Miller's face. Desperately, he tore his lodge ring and cut it in two and, and pound and f- to pound in flat, a flat of garters and suspenders. It won a few inches more. Then they stopped. Feet, feet from their goal. Miller groaned. He tossed his pocket knife in his uh, in his hand. And we've got to get out of foot of this, he estimated. But it still leaves us way short. Probably Erickson snapped his fingers. Shoes, he growls. They're full of nails. Come to me with that knife, Dave. We'll cut out them out, every one of them out. And in ten minutes, the shoes reduce a ragged pole to tutted leather. Degerson's deaf fingers painlessly placed the nails in one by one in the line. The distance left to cover was less than six inches. He lined up the few, last few nails, the, and both men sinking back in their heels. They saw there was no gap. They saw there was a gap of three inches to cover. Broke, beaten, Nelson grinded out by three inches. Three inches in the present. Yet it might as well be three million, million miles by his body. Felt as though he didn't win the vase. His muscles ached and strained, so taunt with his nerves. He leaped as though stung when Major nozzled. A cold nose in his hand again. Automatically began to stroke the block back. Well, that licks us, he muttered. There ain't another piece of movable metal in, his, in the world. Major kept whimpering and pushing against him. Annoyed and druggish, shoved him away. Go away, he muttered. I don't feel like... That suddenly his eyes widened as his touch encountered wet or, or metal he yelled. There he is, he yelled. The last link, the name plate and Dolly Mon- 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 Major's collar. A flashy tore the little wet to the brass plate with dog collar. Erickson took it from his grasp. Sweat stood t- shining his skin. He held a bit of metal over the gap between the two wire and pole. That is it, this is it, he smiled bitterly. Brittlely. Yeah, we on our way, Dave. Where? I don't know. The death or the back to life, but we're going. The red all clipped up into place. Live, wiring, withering wire leaped through the uh, through live. The metal clipped into place. Live, withering power leaped through the wire, snarling across metal partial breaks. Transformers began to hum. Humming grew louder, softly singing. Singing softly, the brooms gobe, their hands but grew to green. The Miller felt a curious valiantness. The snap his brain. An Erickson major in the laboratory faded from his senses. There came an interval, but the only sound was the soft sobbing. He had been hearing as if in a dream. Then the blackness enfolded him, the soft velvet. The miller was opening his eyes to see if really walls, his own kitchen around him. Somebody cried out, Dave, oh Dave, Dave dear. It's Helen's voice. It was Helen who created his own head in her lap and bent her, her face close to his. Oh, thank God you're alive. Helen Fuller murmured, What were you doing here? I couldn't go through with it. I couldn't leave you. I came back and I heard the shot. 
and ran in. Doctor could, could, should be here. I called him five minutes ago. Five minutes? How long have I been since I shot myself? Oh, just six or seven minutes. I called Doctor right away. Miller took a deep breath. It might, that, it, then it must have been a dream. All that to happen in a few minutes. It was impossible. How could I have botched the job? He muttered. I wasn't drunk enough to miss myself completely. Hale looked at a huge revolver, straight like a sink. Oh, the old 45 of Grandpa's. We loaded since the Civil War. Guess the powder it got damp or something. It just sort of spluttered inside of exploding properly. So it's, uh, so it's exploding properly. They promised me something. You won't do, ever do anything like this again. If you promise not, I promise not to nag you. Dave Miller closed his eyes. There wouldn't be no need, any need to like Helen. Some people take a lot of teaching. I had my lesson. You got ideas about the store. I've been too lazy to what, keep, what, try out. You know, I feel more like fighting right now than I've had for years. We're licking, won't we, honey? Helen buried her face in the hollow of his shoulder, and quite softly, her words were too muffled to be intelligible. But Dave Miller understood. She might, she... That what she meant. He thought the whole thing was a dream. Jared Nelson, Time Impulsor, a major. But that night, he read an item in the evening courier. It was to keep him thinking for many days. Police of the death of the scientists here in the laboratory. John M. Erickson, director of Wanamaker Institution, died at his work last night. Erickson was a beloved and valuable figure in the world of science. But he was his recently published Time Lapse Theory. Two strange circumstances surrounded his death. One was the presence of a German shepherd dog in the laboratory. His head crushed as if it were a sledgehammer. There was a ch- chain of small metal objects stretching one corner of the room or the other. He intended to make the place of wire, a, a wire, a circuit. Please have a discount, it's the idea. The roll of wire only a few feet from the body. The end.